get get started. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to uh, chair this panel on science, energy, and sustainable economic growth. Um, and uh, we're going to have four speakers, and they're each going to speak for 15 to 20 minutes. And then we'll take at the end we'll take questions so that all of the panelists can participate. <clears throat> so uh, the first speaker is Dan Riker. Um, he recently joined Google, where he serves as Director of Climate Change and Energy Initiatives for the company's new venture called Google.org. Um, this has been capitalized with more than a billion dollars of Google stock to make investments and advance policy in the areas of climate change and energy, global poverty, and global health. Um, uh, Mr. Riker previously served as President and Co-Founder of New Energy Capital Corporation, um, and he's also a member of General Electric's uh, Eco Imagination Adv Advisory Board. From 1997 to 2001, Mr. Riker was Assistant Secretary of Energy for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy, and prior to that, he held several other posts in the Department of Energy. Prior to these roles in the Department of Energy, Mr. Riker was a senior attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council, where he focused on the federal government's energy and nuclear programs, as well as environmental law and policy issues in the former Soviet Union. Uh, Mr. Riker holds a BA in biology from Dartmouth College um, and a JD from Stanford Law School. Yeah. Well, good morning, all. Thank you very much, Mark. And hello to Jason, Venke, and Bill. Very pleased to talk to you about what we're doing at Google. That bio was a few years out of date, but I will not attempt to correct it, um, just as long as I, I state for the record that I'm no longer a member of several things that I was uh -oh. alluded to. So <laughs> with that, I am very pleased to be here today and talk to you a little bit about this broader world of science, technology, innovation, and, and a little bit about what we are doing at Google. Let me see if I can. Aha. Uh -huh. I need to find my. Oh. Well, when the Google guys can't operate the computers. <laughs> <laughs> this is. Let's see. And now I've got to put this into. <sighs> No, you can better do this. see it on here, but there we go. quite a chemical engineer. Yeah, I'm a chemical <laughs> engineer. You'll see a slide I have later called ET meets IT, energy technology meets information technology. I think we're seeing the, the conflict there. In any event, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, and let me begin with a, with a thought that I've always liked. The future is not what it used to be, and if there ever was a moment where that's the case when you think about our environmental, energy, climate, security challenges, this is it. But I've also, I think this is very true, the best way to predict the future is indeed to invent it. And I think that's what's so exciting about this moment, despite the daunting, the daunting challenges we face in this country, in the EU, in Asia, and, in, and indeed globally, I think we do have this wonderful opportunity to, to invent this, this, great, this great future. This is the framework that I like to think about uh, this future, particularly with regard to sustainable energy. It involves technology, policy, and finance. And I think too often each of us work in one of those buckets and, and don't spend enough time thinking about the other two and how they all interact. What I've tried to do in my own work, what I encourage others to do when I work with students is 
Go deep in one of these, but do understand the implications of the other two. We're not going to move technologies forward unless there's adequate capital, unless there's the right <laughs> policy mechanisms in place. You can work your way around that triangle from that perspective. So to me, this is, is, is an important frame. So why the heck is Google involved in this? What are we doing in the energy and in the energy area? Um, very quickly, we're a significant electricity user. All those instantaneous searches that everyone has come to rely on, there's a lot of, there are a lot of data centers behind those and quite a bit of electricity use. Group of engineers very interested in this whole area. Um, we have capital and are beginning to put it to work through investments in technology and projects. And we think that, that our products can also make a difference. So this, this energy area is an emerging one for Google. We're very interested in it, and I'll tell you a little bit about that work. Drawing the connections to science, technology, and innovation and the role of government and the role of, private and the, of the private sector. So let me begin with ET meets IT. Um, that that uh, burned out old room air conditioner and, and your laptop computer. Where, where do they intersect? Well, obviously, there's lots and lots of excitement about tomorrow's smart grid. Emphasis on tomorrow. We have a, a very old, an old grid that needs a lot of work. But there's, there's great opportunity going forward, whether it's cleaner energy generation, advanced transmission and distribution, smarter homes, plug-in cars. The, the whole area, I think, is, is very exciting. And it is indeed that intersection of, of energy technology and information technology. We're particularly interested in it from a couple of perspectives. One is energy savings. Um, how do you get information in front of people in a much faster and more effective way to take advantage of what are just, at the beginning, simple behavioral changes that people can make, resulting in 5 to 15 percent savings in the way they operate their home? If you can go on and encourage them to make changes to their home, uh, the, the savings are larger, and if we can get to a point where demand response, the house, the building, talking to the grid, there's even more opportunities there. We've created a product called Google Power Meter. Um, it sits on the iGoogle homepage where lots of people go to get the weather and the sports and stocks, and it gives you <laughs> access in real time or near real time to your electricity use, either as a result of a smart meter being installed in the home or a or a device that clips on the fuse box. As we say, knowledge is less power, and that's a real, we, we're beginning to see some results. We're certainly not the only one in this area. Lots and lots of work going on on how you get to people, encourage them to think about their own home energy use, make behavioral changes, and go on to make, to make bigger changes. One of my colleagues discovered, for example, that he put this power meter in his tiny little apartment in San Francisco, and he started seeing all these big spikes and realized he was paying for all the washers and dryers in the basement. <laughs> that was a revelation. Um, lots, of, lots and lots of stories like that, that that you immediately come upon. I didn't realize what my 30-year-old refrigerator was really costing to run in the home until we put this on. And what about refrigerators? I think this is an interesting story about science, technology, innovation, where policy technology, and technology meet. Um, the boring old refrigerator, which used 2,000 kilowatt hours a year in the early 1970s. Federal policy, state policy drove that down to eight or 900 kilowatt hours a year um, around 1990. Uh, another standard took it down further. A standard we set at the end of the Clinton administration drove it down even further to 450 kilowatt hours a year. And just yesterday, a new standard was announced that will take it below 400 kilowatt hours a year. That's a huge, huge saving in a device that's gotten bigger, has more features, and increasingly, increasingly will be able to talk to the electric grid. You know, does it really matter whether you make ice in the middle of the day when it's 100 degrees out or maybe at night when it might be better for the grid? So the boring old refrigerator, um, policy meets technology, lots of innovation, ET meets IT. Uh, it's, a great, it's a great story and a great example, I think, of, of where we can go in so many, so many exciting areas. Plug-in cars, another area of interest of ours at Google. We call our initiative Recharge It. And Motivated by lots and lots of things, 
and, 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 that is, and that is one of them. As, as, as Jason has heard me many times, this, this slide has personal meaning to me because uh, I delivered our third child in the front seat of a car at a Shell station in Vermont on a cold day in April seven years ago. So um, my wife hates this slide. Um, at Google, a few years ago, we built a fleet of, of plug-in cars. These are aftermarket Toyota Priuses and Ford Escapes. Uh, we went to a shop nearby where they do these conversions, and we've been testing them ever since, collecting tons and tons of data. These are driven by both Google employees, and we also hired professional drivers to go out and drive each car 2,000 2, miles to replicate what an average American would do uh, driving a car like this. The data is impressive, you know, over 90 miles per gallon for the plug-in aftermarket Prius compared to 45 or so for a regular Prius and the Ford Escapes at almost 50 miles per gallon versus some, somewhere in the, in the 30s. Interesting data, you know, I, I think it shows again where, where some innovation and technology come together. You can do good things. And obviously the exciting thing is what's, what's happening now, which is lots of manufacturers, including the big ones, GM and Nissan next, coming to market with plug-in vehicles. Uh, but it raises some very interesting technology challenges. How would you, in fact, incorporate tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of these vehicles into the grid effectively, and on that hot day on the East Coast when it's 100 degrees out and 5 million of these plug in at the same moment at 6 p.m. when people arrive at home, not take down the grid. So some of our software folks have begun to do some software development of how you'd integrate large numbers of these into the grid, taking as an interesting example um, how you could take advantage of wind production, for example, in Texas. How could, as the wind comes up at night, you charge more and more cars as it comes back down in the morning, take those off the grid? What could you do um, to make more effective use of what too often is, is a less valuable resource in the form of wind, which doesn't always blow when you want it to blow, through smart software that integrates these cars and this intermittent resource? We are indeed very interested in renewable electricity. Our initiative is called RE less than C, Renewable Electricity Cheaper Than Coal. And it relates to an observation that I think many have made, which is we've got a long, long way to go when it comes to the cost of renewable electricity and having it compete straight up with much larger sources of energy, uh, coal here, coal in China, natural gas, nuclear, and indeed U.S. efficiency, which I'm happy to say is down there near the bottom with, with the cheapest of our energy sources. We've got a long way to go when it comes to, to renewables. We now have some folks at Google doing, doing R&D um, um, on how to make some breakthroughs in, in renewable energy technology. We're supporting some external R&D, addressing some policy barriers, and, and, and making some investments. Again, working our way around that triangle of technology, policy, and investment. One of these areas, which the U.S. government gets a lot of credit for having really gotten started in a very sig significant way is concentrating solar power or solar thermal, a technology, the big mirrors in the desert, uh, technology on its way back. It, it, it unfortunately saw a couple of decade hiatus, but on its way back in a significant way, but still a long distance to go. Um, what do we do to, in terms of the engines? How do we get beyond the need for steam? Um, in these concentrating solar power plants. How could we dramatically cut the cost of the mirrors that really drive these systems? So, so we've got some engineers working on it. Um, Sam Baldwin is here from the Department of Energy and in the Office of Efficiency and Renewables. A lot more money going in the direction of, of this kind of technology. And we're pretty hopeful where you could take this technology, bringing technology together uh, with some aggressive policy, for example, a renewable energy standard, and as the technologies come down, the capital will start to flow in much larger quantities. Another area we're interested in is what's called enhanced geothermal systems. It used to be called hot, dry rock a couple of decades ago. This is not traditional geothermal where you drill down to a pocket of steam or hot water, but instead where you drill into a hot rock formation, fracture the rock, put water down there, bring it back up, make steam, and turn a turbine with the steam. Huge opportunity there but some big challenges in, in taking advantage of it. Some big technology challenges, major challenge in terms of, of, of capital formation. There's a lot of reluctance about these projects because the technology has not been adequately demonstrated and it has some real challenges. 
But the resource is potentially vast, tens of thousands of megawatts at, at the three kilometer level, hundreds of thousands at six kilometers, and if you could get down to 10 kilometers, you'd be looking at, at millions of megawatt potential. Texas alone, take 2% of the Texas EGS resource between three and 10 kilometers, 2% of that, you'd be almost double the installed electrical generating capacity of the state today. Um, very good resource in that, in that state. Interesting story here, a company that's got a technology funded by both the government and the venture capital world, government and private capital coming together. It's called Potter Drilling. We put a little bit of money into it. DOE has put money into it. And it essentially uh, is working on a technology, non-contact drilling, essentially extraordinarily hot water that can uh, work its way through rock. Obviously very interested uh, folks from, from other parts of the energy industry, for example, the natural gas industry, if this, if this can actually work. So just a quick example of where government industry comes together to advance this technology that could, could if we see this sort of breakthrough that we might see, could radically reduce costs. Finally, working our way around this triangle, technology, finance, and policy is indeed the policy area. Jason is a, is a real leader in, in, in D.C. on energy policy. You'll hear from him in a few minutes. Let me just talk quickly about three areas that we're interested in. One, getting back to E.T. meets I.T., is, is, is in fact establishing a federal right to know electricity consumption information. It's called the ENO, little e, capital K-N-O-W law. Congressman Markey has introduced it. And it comes as a surprise to people, but in, in many places in this country, it's not clear you have a right of access to your own home energy information. This would establish that. Key to this meeting are the next two, I think. Uh, taking today's R&D &D &D budget uh, for energy and the federal government from the roughly three to four billion we're seeing to 15 to 30 billion as the president has called for. Absolutely positively essential if we're gonna see the kind of progress we need to see from an energy and environmental security and a economic standpoint. And I'll, and I'll, I'll talk a, a bit in a minute about the Clean Energy Deployment Administration. John Holden did a great job talking about this picture. It's a rich but complicated one inside the federal government today. Lots of opportunities, lots of new entities that have been created, lots of way to, to, to drive things from, from very basic research all the way to full-scale deployment. The good news is those entities are there. The less good news, I'd say, is we don't have the kind of support we need for our D&D. We do have this nice bump as a result of the stimulus package. I was on the Obama transition team. It was one of the most exciting moments of my career, being able to actually sit down and start talking about billions and billions of dollars to be spent in this area. But unfortunately, we're seeing a real tailing off from that stimulus funding, and in fact, I think we're going to see a drop from 2010 to 2011 um, when the final budget comes in for our D&D &D, um, in the energy area. And, and that, that's a real challenge. That's a real problem. Meanwhile, we've seen a big bump in the third D, deployment at DOE, as a result of the stimulus, but we're going to see a terrific drop off there as well. The deployment dollars that the stimulus provided to do lots of interesting things out in the world are going to drop to next to nothing, unfortunately. So that takes me to my last point. Uh, we at Google are big fans of something called the Clean Energy Deployment Administration. A, a whole group of us from the business and investment community have a meeting later today at the White House to make the pitch for CETA. CETA essentially is an entity that would, would be established to deal with a very critical problem, and that is government investment venture capital investment gets energy technologies to a point where they work at pilot scale. But how you get the first couple of big plants built that can cost a hundred million, five hundred million, a billion dollars for the first plant, how you get that finance is a real problem. We call it the valley of death. It is indeed the death knell for so many critical technologies. The current loan guarantee program that the DOE is running is a first step. It's got its problems. Those can be fixed. But Longer term, we think we need to create this, this entity called CETA that has a much broader range of tools that go beyond loan guarantees and an entity that could actually make some money providing this capital and therefore be self-funding, not have to go back to the Congress for appropriations to keep going. So we will, we will have this meeting today. We, we 
We have some hope. It's already been adopted in the House in the American Clean Energy and Security Act. The Senate Energy Committee has already adopted it on a bipartisan basis with support from the renewables, coal, nuclear communities. Um, we have a modest shot, we hope, in the lame duck session to actually get this put in place with a couple other key energy provisions. And finally, we've got big opportunities for cooperation, but also big, big opportunities, serious competition um, coming from the Chinese today. I think uh, the, the front page story in the New York Times a few weeks ago really, really caught people's attention um, when you look at the amount of capital that's going into clean energy work in China in a way that just isn't happening in this country, um, and we are losing a major race. Uh, be interesting to talk about areas of cooperation with the EU on this front, because obviously that's the third big leg of this stool. And, and most importantly would be how could, the, how could the globe better cooperate on these critical technologies to move things forward? Competition is, is important, but cooperation at the same time could really drive these technologies forward from an environmental security and an economic standpoint. So with that, I thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Um, next up is uh, Venki Narayanamurti. Uh, Venki is Director of Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Um, he is credited with developing the field of phonon optics, the manipulation of mono uh, energetic acoustic beams. I'm sure I actually know what that means. Probably most of you don't. Um, uh, and he's uh, also very active in the field of semiconductor nanostructures. Um, uh, Venki was uh, Dean of Engineering at UC Santa Barbara and then became uh, Dean of the Division of Engineering and Applied Science at um, Harvard and was the founding dean of what is now called the School of Engineering and Applied Science at Harvard. Um, he's served on uh, numerous national and international advisory committees. Um, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences, as well as the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, uh, in addition to serving on, uh, in, in administrative and research roles, um, Narayana Murthy, uh lectures widely on solid-state computer and communication technologies and on the management of science, technology, and public policy. From 1968 to 1987, uh, Venki worked at the famed AT&T Bell Labs, where he became head of the Semiconductor Electronics Research Department in 1976 and served as director of the Solid State Electronics Research Laboratory from 1981 to 1987. Um, uh, he then was on assignment from Bell Labs um, as Vice President of Research and Exploratory Technology at Sandia National Laboratories. Um, uh, uh, Venki has a PhD in physics from Cornell. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, uh, I guess I need to get... How do I... Uh... I don't know where the cursor is. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, now I got it. Yeah, now I And I can go to the... Thank you very much, Mark. Mark and I come from the same field, and it's wonderful to have you as the chair. Uh, what I would want to talk about is uh, a, li a little bit about, actually, the role of science, engineering, technology, and innovation. I was very happy to see in the director of the NSF's title, Science and Engineering, even though I come from condensed matter physics, I really feel a lot about this total chain, and should that, which should not be forgotten as we discuss science and innovation policy. There is an alternative view. The science is about what is. It is about understanding. Engineering is about what will be. So, in fact, to have progress in energy technologies, you will need enormous amounts of creative engineering before it will actually succeed. And, you know, I like to think of creativity as there in all disciplines. Creativity is having an original thought or idea. Invention is also having a creative idea or thought, but which has value. And innovation is something which actually has broad impact towards society. 
And we need to understand that innovation is there in science, in there in engineering, in all phases of technology, and all phases of going to the marketplace. And those who are from industry can tell you a lot more about that. Second, science and novel technologies just do not always grow out from science. That often technology leads science. I like to start my courses by saying the science of thermodynamics owes more to the steam engine than the other way around, and to James Watt, really. And in fact, the thermodynamics then came, and you made much better steam engines and internal combustion engines, etc. And one of the most interesting examples, my friend Arun Majumdar, who is now director of RPIE, pointed out not just the transistor, but way back in 1900, Sir William Crookes, who was the president of the Royal Society, said, Fertilizers will be extremely important. There was no way of making artificial fertilizers. People used chili and saltpeter, and they knew that nitrogen was the most abundant element on Earth, but nobody knew how to fixate nitrogen and convert nitrogen into ammonia. And actually, Fritz Haber and Karl Brosch, working for an industrial laboratory, BASF, actually took 10 years to fixate nitrogen and develop ammonia fertilizers, and they, of course, both won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. So to understand this interplay between science and engineering and technology is extremely important. People referred to the rising of the gathering storm, and in fact, a couple of them had a chart which is called Pasteur's Carter. Now that I teach in science, technology, and policy, Donald Stokes, who used to be a dean at Princeton, wrote a famous book in 1990 or thereabouts called Pasteur's Quadrant, where he highlighted this thing. And if you look at the left-hand corner way above, there's a picture of Niels Bohr and Einstein. In the right-hand bottom corner are two of my heroes, Edison and Graham Bell from New Jersey and Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is the place where you spent, some of the greatest inventors of our time. So which is more important? You can take your pick. And then what I learned from Donald Stokes' book, the picture on the left you may not recognize is of Pasteur, who actually invented the field of microbiology because he was working for fermentation companies and wanted to understand the process of fermentation. So, uh, and of course, on the other hand, the famous picture of Bardeen, Breton, and Shockley. So, there are many classes of innovation. Innovation is not a single method, instead there are four more or less separate ones. Brian Arthur wrote a beautiful book this past year he used to be at the Santa Fe Institute for Complex Systems, on the nature of technology. And innovation consists in novel solutions being arrived in standard engineering, the thousands of small advances and fixes. It consists of radically novel technologies. It consists in novel technology developing by changing the internal parts. Or adding to and it actually is like very much like biology. It keeps evolving as you put technological pieces together. It consists in the whole bodies of the emerging building or the increasing trust. And that's what innovation is about. And so if you think about, again, I like to tell everybody why you needed engineering. And, and when, even when I went to Harvard, nuclear magnetic resonance was invented by a colleague of mine many years ago, Nicholas Blumberg, and was a graduate student in the physics department at Harvard. And if you look at the new NMR, little coil with kind of things when I was a graduate student, you never thought it would go to MRI. It was not just simply going from there, but actually it took applied physicists and electrical engineers who understood that the gradient of the magnetic field was important for imaging and led to the Nobel Prize in medicine in 2003. And the same thing happened with the transistor. Bardeen Batrishak was a huge little crystal of germanium, and if you ever thought that would lead to integrated circuits with billions of transistors on a chip, you would have to have your hexagon. The Great Bell Laboratories was literally manufacturing thousands of germanium crystals unsuccessfully until Kilby and Noyce discovered how to put pin films. And of course, Kilby won the Nobel Prize in physics back in 20, 2008. And at Santa Barbara, my friend Herb Cromer and others won. So lots of Nobel Prizes going to engineering. So this is very important that we recognize this. Innovation has been recognized as a driving force for economic growth. And as oh, Schumpeter said, it has lots of creative destruction. And that's what happens with technologies. Now, I want to actually go into energy innovation because I feel quite strongly, and I'm covered by my Bell Labs past. People say the, the electricity industry is highly regulated. The telephone company was a highly regulated monopoly. Hmm. It was, they also had to be, there were utilities with large capital costs 
to change the telephone exchange, we could still have Aunt Mary pushing the wire into the exchange instead of electronic switching systems. You have to ask, how come they developed fiber optic communication systems at the speed of light if they were asleep at the wheel? One has to ask this question, what is wrong with the structure of electric utilities and electric industry? Because I just don't buy the issue of simple regulation at all. One has to understand the differences between these different kind of regulated monopolies. And so, and the other feature, if you look at all the Nobel Prizes, it's not just Bell Labs, it was IBM, it was General Electric, it was Xerox Park. Enormous amounts of innovation happened because you combined these things in an interesting way. One of the things which is important, the utilities and our IBMs, today Google, they were highly vertically integrated companies where manufacturing and the others were in one, and there was systems integration at the highest level. If you separate the research and development in physical science and engineering from the manufacturing, you have a big problem. I often hear from people in Washington, from economists, that we will do the R&D here and we'll do all the manufacturing in China. Ladies and gentlemen, ultimately the R&D itself will die. I, that's what happened at Bell Labs when we separated the operating companies, Bellcore and all of those. There are hundreds of examples. So if some economists tell you that we can have the manufacturing somewhere else, we'll do the R&D, tell them they do not know what they're doing. So GE's email, I was so pleased to read this uh, uh, this last week when the chairman of General Electric said, US policy deadlock holds back clean energy development it's just stupid that we have here today. Energy is one of the places I worry about most. The rest of the world is moving 10 times faster. The United States will remain an underdog in clean energy unless Congress can pass partition deadlock and produce effective national energy policies. You always need a systems integrator. The government is very important in this. Energy is an incredibly long cycle industry. Without a market signal of some consistency, the right investments aren't going to be made. The whole energy, if you are really serious about it, is a relic. It has fundamentally no basis in the modern world. It's not me. It is the chairman of a, one of our largest and most successful energy companies. You may not realize General Electric started, I think, as Edison Electric, when actually you combine R&D and manufacturing together. So innovation in energy is more difficult. We have... Uh, a paper which we wrote, I was very glad that Dan Riker had some of the things from, from ERD3 project, which was started by John Holden, and I'm the fortunate successor. Limited, we wrote back in 2009 exactly what actually Emelt is saying. Limited and uncertain market signal for energy is a serious problem. It is large, and technologies are developed over long time frames. If you go by the stock market cycle, there's nothing you can do. You can curse NREL. But if a change is bounded by factors of two within one year, there's no way it can function in a rational manner. And as it are very heterogeneous with each stage and have to compete in the marketplace with integrated technologies. So uh, this shows you from our paper the volatility in the budget cycle. We cannot have long-range energy R&D with that kind of volatility in, in, in the place between a Republican and a Democratic administration. It makes no sense at all. It makes no sense at all. So guiding principles we wrote. Importance, better align. You've got to align the management structure. If you separate the R&D from that, that's why you need the systems integrator. Somebody has to do the systems integration. It is not capital, uh, what they call communist. It is the way successful companies work. It is the way successful technologies work because somebody has to do the integrative thinking and make the research R&D go seamlessly into the technology. Very important matter of policy, which we seem to get uh, taken uh, badly because of this argument between the government has no role. Having a clearly defined mission, attracting visionary and technically excellent leaders, that was the case with AT&T 100 years ago. There was a visionary leader who knew what to do. Cultivating an entrepreneur and competitive culture, setting up a structure that balances independence and accountability, and ensuring stable. Those were the ingredients which led Marbell, a regulated monopoly, which we look fondly on. It can be done. So this picture, which uh, uh, is taken from one of our ERD3 and Dan showed, I want to mention a couple of things here. Secretary Chu's idea of somehow trying to call Bell Lablets, you could call them IBM Lablets, you could call them GE Lablets, it doesn't matter. You want to 
link the basic research and the technology in a very interesting way. Research, we said at Bell Labs, needs to be insulated but not isolated. If you're Einstein, you leave him alone, but for most of us who are not Einstein, you need to have a delicate ecosystem. Therefore, having frontier research centers and innovation hubs which become more and more defined is a good thing. When you combine engineering and technology with the science and the ARPA-E and having different diverse fundings, introducing some competition, it's good for the Department of Energy to have something slightly separate with a little bit of competition so that you don't go sleep at the wheel. Too often people ask, shall we consolidate? Consolidation, ladies and gentlemen, is not necessarily a good thing. So, the one place which is really very important is this valley of death, and that is shown with the large-scale demonstrations. And, of course, the D Department of Energy did make some progress under Matt Rogers in funding some of those, even though money was appropriated back in 2005 more recently. It still is a great challenge and correctly pointed out by Dan. So bringing technologies to market, you know, another thing. We know we have a learning curve. Solar cells get cheaper technologies get cheaper. But in the energy business, there are some very interesting things. You look at nuclear. The cost of nuclear was going down, and then it started going up as the licensing regime became so tough. Now, some of it were not unreasonable, but that's a problem. And clearly, this will be a problem in the future. So factors contribute to reduction in technology costs. Learning by searching within a set. Knowledge pillars from other sectors. Economies of scale. Economies of scale. Learning by doing. These are all long-term public policies which need to take place. This is what we are doing research on in the energy technology. And the United States, we believe, needs to improve the energy innovation system big time. It needs to provide this. This has been recognized more recently by studies of PCAST. I believe the report is still to be issued. Uh, the wide range of actors involved in the policy process the, and the innovation is always as evident. So they're ripe for improvement. And the, this is a, one of the rare windows in time. And I hope the country will actually take that into account. Obviously, international collaborations will be important. People talk about taking the model of Silicon Valley. Some of it is okay for certain aspects of the technology, but not for certain aspects. So one has to do that with some caution in terms of the investments. Areas where better, these are the areas we're currently working on. How do you decide how to invest in biofuels, in solar, etc.? So we're doing a whole bunch of expert elicitations and talking to the experts, and hopefully we'll give some guidance as to how the budget should be allocated. So that's what we used to do at Bell Labs. And there was a well-defined system, and that's what the leaders did, and, and that needs to be done. If you separate, again, the electricity providers from the others, it would not work. Selecting and executing the right projects. We looked at the Department of Energy uh, Cooperative Research. And there are hundreds of such cooperative research and development agreements, but there is no overarching strategy from the higher level which would actually make sure that these cooperative are ready. We do get some good things where you throw let a thousand flowers bloom. There's nothing wrong with that. Great model for university research, but not for energy technology development because it has to be done strategically. So there needs to be a great deal of improvement in the structure of the DOE structure and management in the role of those different institutions. Thank you very much for listening. Um, the next panelist is uh, Jason Grumet. Uh, Jason is the president of the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, he has 20 years of experience working at the intersection of science, policy, and politics. Throughout his career, he has built and led unique coalitions that have realized significant policy achievements at both the state and federal level. With the leadership of former Senator Majority Leaders Howard Baker, Tom Daschle, Bob Dole, and George Mitchell, the BPC was, was created to develop substance-based bipartisan solutions to tackle some of the nation's most pressing policy challenges through constructive argument and principled compromise. The BPC is currently focused on five ma major issues, national security, health care, energy, transportation, and agriculture. Um, since 2001, Jason has directed the National Commission on Energy Policy, which is now a project of the BPC. Under Jason's leadership, the NCEP has released a number of significant studies and continues to actively advocate for its policy recommendations in Congress and with the administration. 
Jason received his BA from Brown University and his JD from Harvard. Thank you, Mark. Nice to see everybody. I am fond of knowing my limitations, so I'm going to um, do this for my presentation today. Hopefully that will not uh, disturb any of you. It's what, a, what a wimp, Jason. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's a, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, as Mark indicated, the Bipartisan Policy Center was founded um, by four former Senate Majority Leaders, and in particular, it's nice to uh, acknowledge and honor Senator Baker uh, here today. Um, and it was founded around the, the simple and hopefully not naive notion that real partisans, true Democrats and Republicans, could still come together and, in fact, revive the dark art of principled compromise from time to time to do big things when the country uh, needed those. And we are clearly at a moment um, where that is the case today. Um, we find ourselves not having a lot of competition right now in the, in the bipartisan space, which is, a, uh, <laughs> I think, a comparative advantage. But we're still trying to figure that out exactly. Um, and I should thank Dan. He was kind uh, to suggest I was a, a leader in DC energy policy, although that's a little bit like um, being given kind of you know, the General Custer Award for community relations at the moment, <laughs> since um, recent happenings in the energy policy world have not been um, particularly uh, profound or helpful. But I'm going to try today to talk a little bit in a somewhat more policy and political context about energy and innovation and how that is likely to be situated in the um, next couple of years of our executive branch and congressional considerations. And I'm going to start um, with a premise that's probably not going to um, offend many of you, and that is to say that um, energy innovation tends to have, from a political standpoint, really, I think the technical word is crappy advocates. Um, I presume this is a room that is more committed and knowledgeable about energy innovation, energy technology, R&D, than you know, probably any in Washington right now. So just a show of hands, who here runs a PAC? <coughs> 527? polling company, branding company. Who has ever had a phone bank? Guess what? The energy innovation industry doesn't get a lot of funding from the U.S. Congress. And, you know, we're going to hear these numbers thrown around a lot of different ways uh, over the course of the day. But, you know, our, uh, our math says that we basically put about $5.1 billion a year into energy R&D, thought of broadly. If you look at it as a percentage of uh, the industry, I'm, I'm fond of a friend of mine who says it's zero because it's less than half of 1%, and he's a good engineer, and he rounds that down to zero. Um, <laughs> and if you look at that across, you know, I mean, you know, the auto industry is about 2.5%, the computer you know, tech is about 8%, everyone points out pharma, which is up about 19%. I mean, you know, these numbers are all a little wrong and a little malleable, but the, the essential truth is that we do not have a core, competent advocacy community to try to secure the kind of funding that this enterprise ultimately needs. And so... What I want to do is talk a little bit about a project that we have um, been working on that is in some small ways trying to change that, and then a little bit of a projection forward about what the, uh, what the next Congress might hold. Um, so I guess about a year ago, uh, in collaboration with an organization called Climate Works, um, we thought it would make sense to try to bring some new people into this discussion. And we were able um, to secure Bill Gates's interest, and from there, of course, getting others became a lot easier. Um, but we created something called the American Energy Innovation Council. And with Bill Gates, uh, Chad Holliday, formerly of uh, DuPont, Norm Augustine, who I'm sure many of you know, Gathering Storm and Lockheed Martin, John Doerr, who has been pretty successful in investing some uh, energy resources, uh, Ursula Burns with Xerox, Tim Sosla with Cummins, and uh, Jeff Immelt with GE, who's just mentioned. We brought this group together. And we brought them together as a group of companies and individuals who all as all should, care deeply and have a significant bottom line interest in energy. But none of them were or are seen as traditional energy companies. Most people think GE makes clock radios. Um, some of you in the room know that they also build a lot of larger pieces of energy infrastructure. Um, but the goal was really threefold. One was to try to start to reframe this discussion, not as a, oh, we have the real economy and then there's that nifty kind of energy economy, but to really try to bring kind of iconic business leaders together to talk in significant you know, frame about innovation in general, in particular to energy. Um, again, to try to bring new advocates forward, because all of the people I just mentioned, in one way or another, do participate in organizations that do those kinds of more politically overt exercises. And then actually also to try to bring some new ideas in. Um, not the idea that we were going to kind of have brand new epiphanies, but the way that one structures the arguments um, we thought would be helpful. And so we, we crafted a plan called a business plan for America's energy future, 
Um, I think we're down to our last 18,000 copies, so if anybody wants one, I'm happy to point you to the correct uh, website. Um, and so let me give you kind of the, the four ideas in that plan, and again, talk a little bit about what's happening um, congressionally. The first idea, no shock, more money. Um, we looked at, you know, the 10 different studies that had been done and basically came down with the notion that we needed to roughly uh, triple energy funding to go from the $5 billion up to about $16 billion, so add $11 billion new dollars, and we did some bottom-up and top-down slices at that. Um, that's going to be tough going forward. Um, but I think it's also uh, important to put it in the right frame. Um, we put an ad in the paper which indicated that we spent, as a nation, as much on potato chips as on new energy innovation. It was actually a little wrong. It was snack chips. We forgot. We, we, sun chips were included in Doritos, and we got that wrong. But the basic essential point <laughs> remains that, you know, when you actually think about the breadth of the crises that most members of our political governance um, understand, our dependence upon foreign oil and climate change, and they're very good at defining those challenges in the true broad global scope that they exist, and then, you know, snack chips. Um, we need more of that kind of accessible analysis. Um, another uh, idea that got a lot of traction, just in terms of in boiling this down to uh, the, the voters, um, and I'm sure this is not exactly right, but uh, if computer chips today were priced at the same and kind of constructed in the same way that they were in the mid-1970s, an Apple iPod would cost a billion dollars and be as large as a building. Now, we've all seen the Mohs curve and the slope, but, but again, framing the arguments in a way that are really hard to um, escape with, again, kind of iconic people and iconic ideas as something that I think we all need to, to work on a little more together. Um, a couple more recommendations. They're largely going to chart uh, nicely what you've heard from uh, Dan and Venke. We think the centers of excellence, these kind of energy innovation hubs idea, is a very important one. And, you know, the work that's going on down in RTP around Oak Ridge, I mean, there are certainly areas, Sandia, where we believe that the government should be really focusing its research around particular technology clusters. Um, we have been big fans of RPE and specifically advocated for that funding to go forward and be increased to a billion dollars a year. Not only are they doing, I think, profoundly interesting work, but from a kind of a risk culture, one of the big challenges, and everyone likes to deride DOE for being conservative, but every time anything goes wrong, they get dragged to Congress and yeah. crap gets beat out of them, which makes you conservative over you know, six <laughs> or seven of those experiences. And one of the things about the ARPA, DARPA kind of ethos is for some reason, maybe because it started with a defense culture, the idea that in order to accomplish great things, you have to have lots of grand failures seems more possible there. And so we see the, the ARPA culture having a real benefit if, in fact, we can broaden that through the larger R&D enterprise. And then a, a last idea, um, and I think the CETA effort, which Dan talked about, which we also support, speaks to this as well, is the idea that we, we have to come at these kind of billion-dollar stair steps more effectively, that the country right now just lacks the ability to take on, whether it's fourth-generation nuclear or true, you know, CCS efforts. Um, we just don't have either the funding or the institutional structure that Congress trusts enough to let those efforts get forward. So we've tried to kind of outline what we think would be some of those uh, processes, and that's really what we're continuing to work on. Um, so that was a goal to try to bring some new voices into the debate. Now let's talk about the debate that uh, we are encouraging these no, new voices to enter. Um, I think in simple terms, I'd say we are both polarized and broke, which is a tough climate. Um, and let me just kind of kick through, though, what I think are some possibilities going forward. There is discussion right now about whether we could pass simple energy legislation in this lame duck session. So after the elections, Congress comes back for probably three or four weeks. Um, anything's always possible. And, you know, lame ducks are quirky uh, political experiences. Um, generally, when the party pushing an idea gets kind of vanquished in the election, however, that idea has a difficult time getting through a lame duck. Um, you know, just generally what we're looking at right now is the Democratic Party that is largely supporting an RES, is generally more supportive of Clean Energy Development Authority, um, unless there is a real unexpected uh, turn in November. It's not impossible. From time to time, people get thrown out of office and they're kind of, you know, grumpy enough that they don't really care what their old constituents think and they try to, you know, spitefully jam something through. It doesn't happen a lot. 
um, people are usually ready just to get out of town. Um, they still have to pass a budget. Um, they still have to probably deal with the uh, Bush tax cuts. Um, so never say never, but I don't think we should expect with any kind of confidence that we're going to see energy legislation passed this December. Um, in terms of where the action is, I think a lot of it's going to be in the near term at EPA, and I won't go into a lot of detail here, but my personal view is it's going to be much more focused on the air toxic standards, what is affectionately known as MACT, Maximum Achievable Control Technology, um, than on the direct carbon regulation. Both will be going on, but I think the actual near term kind of transformational possibilities are much more going to be focused on what air toxics, what new cooling water regulations and ash disposal regulations will do to put weight on the cost of continuing to operate uh, existing coal facilities. There is some possibility of um, power sector legislation. I think the opportunity we saw over the last several months would have been had Congress been willing to pivot from an economy-wide cap-and-trade idea, which unfortunately no one understood, um, to a utility-focused program, which the Congress had had decades of experience with. And that proposition was never really tested, but there continue to be statements, both parties um, expressing willingness to contemplate a carbon program if it was power sector focused. Senator Alexander, who's now third in Republican leadership just the other day, reiterated a willingness to think about a carbon program. And if you had the air toxics and carbon and cooling water and ash, and the utilities have a big concern about the differences uh, that are about to befall them in terms of their dividend taxes. If you wrap that all up, possible you could see legislation move next Congress. Um, and I think a key issue that's going to be tested carefully is the um, definitional transition from a renewable electricity standard to what is either be called a diverse energy standard or a clean power standard, basically shifting the measuring stick from renewable to non-carbon. That seems to be where the movement was um, trending towards the end of the uh, last Congress. That allows one to bring the renewable community and the nuclear community and the geothermal community and the hydro and even the natural gas folks looking for a piece of that action together. Um, if designed thoughtfully, it actually functions a whole lot like a stationary source cap and trade program, um, but it is a truly different frame. The way we used to do reframing in the last climate debate is advocates would come forward and say, I'm reframing the issue. I'm no longer calling it cap and trade, which generally is not the way the communications firm tell you you should do reframing. Usually it's a little more subtle approach. Um, <laughs> But it didn't work. We renamed it six different times, and it came out back to us as cap and tax. If we're going to see anything that looks like an actual direct kind of carbon regime in the power sector, I think it probably will have to have more of a, a diverse energy standard approach. Um, just two more. Energy bill. There were these big energy bills floating around last year. They just got talked about as carbon bills. So, you know, in addition to the cap and trade program, which, you know, we all agree was the most important item on the agenda, there were incredible um, proposals on national building codes and energy efficiency standards and clean energy development authorities and siting authorities, none of which got hardly any attention outside of the kind of, you know, particular folks who really care deeply about those particular issues. But there seemed to be a general wide degree of bipartisan enthusiasm for all this nifty command and control stuff. Um, we spent a lot of time working with Senator Luger, who put together a piece of legislation which was basically the most progressive command and control energy bill that I've certainly ever seen. And as long as it didn't have the words cap and trade in it, it was good to go. In fact, at some of the um, sessions my staff were having with his staff, you know, when, when oil companies come together, they'll often have an anti-disclosure moment where they all say, okay, we're not going to we would have this kind of anti-Republican ideology moment where they'd all drop their heads and say, okay, just to be clear, everything we're about to talk about fundamentally violates the last 20 years of Republican discourse. Good. National building codes, energy efficiency, whatever it was, everybody was on board, as long as it didn't have a disorienting carbon cap. But so there is some possibility, and this I think would be to take the legislation that I think Dan and many others are urging for in the lame duck session and just assume the Congress is going to have to exhale a little bit and then try to take that back up um, in the next year. And finally, and this is a broader um, theme, one project that we're um, working on a lot since uh, whenever I handed you that bio, uh, is the debt. Um, you know, we find ourselves with this tricky little problem of being $13 trillion in debt. And I think that's going to totally dominate the public narrative um, shortly. If there's going to be some moment where we're going to whiplash from stimulus to debt. It's going to be like a Wednesday afternoon at 3 o'clock, and it's going to happen sometime in the next three months, and 
hard to know exactly when. But um, everything now is going to have a fiscal focus. Um, the good news is that we have to shake up the government in pretty significant ways. Um, a number of people who are working with us who would have never supported a carbon tax ever, ever, if it was because of climate change or polar bears, in the context of the need to raise or save $800 billion a year, comparing a carbon tax against other kinds of taxes, like uh, value-added tax or just increased income taxes, all of a sudden get reasonably enthusiastic about carbon pricing. So there, there is a big idea. Revenue may start to um, become a motivator for energy pricing. The smaller idea is more the Robin Hood standpoint. As, as Dan pointed out, the renewables funding, the stimulus funding is about to hit a cliff. Um, the only way we're going to be able to perpetuate those efforts is if we find other money. And the administration has announced an interest in trying to reduce the existing fossil subsidies for incumbent industries. Um, I think that you're going to start to see um, a pretty aggressive focus looking at energy subsidies writ large and trying to figure out if we have a total energy subsidy budget of, you know, call it $10 billion a year, where is it going? Um, and that's probably not a bad conversation for the country to have. It's not going to be a pretty conversation, and we're going to need um, some of those more political voices we talked about to, to win it. Um, but I think we should anticipate that the funding issues are going to become now, I think, really central. And since right now, you know, energy innovation is on the losing end of most of those funding discussions, it's probably not a bad thing to at least have that uh, opportunity. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Um, so the last uh, panelist is uh, Bill uh, Banholzer. Bill um, is Executive Vice President of Ventures, New Business Development and Licensing, and Chief Technology, Technology Officer for the Dow Chemical Company. Uh, he's a member of Dow's Executive Leadership Committee, which is responsible for corporate strategy and financial performance, and also of the Strategy Board, responsible for the review and approval um, of the company's strategy and resource allocation decisions. Um, uh, uh, prior to Dow, uh, Bill had a 22-year career at GE, whereas Vice President of Global Technology uh, at GE Advanced Materials, he was responsible for worldwide technology uh, and engineering. Uh, in 2002, Bill was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, uh, and he's now a member of the uh, one of the 12 counselors comprising the governing board of the NAE. Um, he received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from Marquette University and master's and Ph.D. in chemical engineering from University of Illinois. And I have to add that he's a certified Six Sigma master black belt. So don't mess with him. <laughs> Thank you. He's going last. Well, like Dan and Google, some of you might be asking, what's a chemical engineer and a chemistry company coming and talking at this energy forum? But I remind you that we move energy around in two forms, either electrons or chemical bonds. And actually, chemical bonds is a very effective way to move energy around. If you wanted to take the energy stored in a gallon of gasoline, and that's the equivalent to taking 15,000 gallons of water and lifting it to the same height of the Hoover Dam. So chemical bonds are very important in the energy industry. And as we look at biofuels or we look at uh, flue uh, gas uh, cleanup, these are all chemical plants that we build. And finally, I'd argue that chemical engineers do learn thermodynamics. We do know how to draw control volumes, and we do know what does and doesn't violate thermodynamics. They're called laws of thermodynamics for a reason. And uh, unfortunately, some of our uh, things that I've come across sort of have forgotten that. I really want to concentrate on three things that I think have been either in missing the dialogue or I think underrepresented, some of which my colleagues have, have brought up. The first one I'd say is, is the time frame. I think if, as we have this dialogue and discussion and, and tackle these truly vexing issues, you need to decide what time frame do you want to have an impact in. There's a difference between deployment, development, and research. So this morning we've been dominated by talking about science and research, and, and I think what you need to understand is if you're going to invent something, you will have an impact 25 years from now. If you start seriously saying, I want to have an impact in the next 10 to 15 years, that means you are in deployment. That means you, need, you can't invent anything. You need to be implementing the technology that we have today. We're building a $20 billion petrochemical complex in Saudi Arabia. 
That plant should come online in about 2015, maybe 2016. The technology for that was frozen in 2008. So, and that's just one plant. So if you think about the magnitude of the energy infrastructure and you start talking about new chemical plants or new refineries or wind farms, or you've got to understand we should be talking about deployment for 15 years. If you're looking at 15 to 25 years, then you can start talking about development and deployment. But if you're talking about invention, you're talking about things that are going to impact us 25 years down the road because by the time you invent and then the, by the time that you develop that, develop means you actually generate a market development plant or a demonstration plant, and then you actually build the commercial units. It's a long process, and I think that people have forgotten it. The second issue is you need to understand where's the capital going to come from for these plants? The capital will only flow if there's an expected return. We don't get to just selectively invest in plants unless they actually generate profits, and we don't actually get to do research unless we can generate a return. In fact, we often say, we, there's no right to do research, at least in the financial sector and the public, uh, private sector. Research is a privilege that we earn every day by creating value for our customers and society that allows us to continue to invent. But there's no God-given right that says you have to do research. You have to prove that it's creating value. And we're reminded of that every quarter when we have to show what our profits are. And our shareholders give us money and then ask us, well, show me the return on that. So we can invest in a few things that are long lead time items, but somewhere you've got to have a return. And the world is flatter than it ever has been before. So we are looking at energy and what you would call fuels, we call feedstocks. So we convert a lot of the hydrocarbon-based products into feedstocks that then are converted into the, the products that you use every day. The clothes that you wear, the computers that we use, the cars that we drive, all come from materials. And those are a intensive, capital-intensive industry. So we, in 2002, spent $8 billion on hydrocarbons and feedstock. And for the last several years, we've been spending 22 to $26 billion in hydrocarbon and feedstocks. So we're very motivated to find alternatives to our current natural gas and oil-based uh, feedstocks that we use. But over the last 60 years, there's a reason we went to them. They are the lowest cost, most concentrated forms of energy. So when we start talking about going away from those, you better have a clear understanding of why and how can you afford it. Now, in Brazil, we're building the biggest world-scale natural product-derived plant. We're going to take sugar cane, we're going to convert that to ethanol, convert that to polyethylene, which is the biggest uh, single commodity product that people would buy throughout the world. That plant's going to be about a billion dollars. So again, the capital of mass is big, and we're actually going to be farmers. We're actually inventing the farm, or building the farm, and we're actually going to harvest it, so we have no supply chain a risk in that problem. But that plant is going to only produce 8% of the polyethylene that just Dow produces. So it's a small part, so a billion dollars for 8% of just Dow's part of the polyethylene chain. And in addition, it's not competing with the Middle East. So when we talk about all these future biofuels, ethanol is the one that's in favor. The ethanol has to cost 15 cents a gallon to compete with Middle East natural gas at 75 cents a million BTU. And in Brazil, we think it'll be ethanol's you know, 70 to 90 cents if you're a farmer. That's not what the market price is. And so we can compete with 90 cent ethanol in Brazil because you can't take natural gas because it's a closed market from the Middle East and bring it to the United States, or bring it to Brazil. But you can bring it to the United States or Europe. So as the world gets flatter, understanding the harmonization of these energy costs is a profound issue for us because the magnitude of the investment for some of these transformations is hundreds of billions to trillions of dollars, and nobody's going to give us that money unless there's a return on that. And when you're saying that you're going to pay a higher price, there's going to be a significant issue. And that's where policy is going to get be involved as well as consumers. And which brings me to my next point of consumer education is critical to this. The people that are actually either going to invest or buy the products need to be educated. And so I uh, will just use one anecdote uh, that, that actually I think is a good summary for sort of some of the challenges we had. In my, uh, I was, had, had given several talks, and one of them I said, look, people today, the majority of people won't pay for green products. They want them, they be, they're a market differentiator, but if you ask them to pay more or give up quality, they'll opt out. They want the same quality at a, the same or lower price and be green. But a few people will pay more, but it's not the majority of the population, at least right now. Well, a reporter from the New York Times was doing a, a piece for Earth Day, and, and contacted me in an interview and said, I can't believe you said this. I mean, geez, President, or Vice President Gore just got the Peace Prize and look at all that has been. And I said, don't confuse awareness of a problem with a willingness to do something about it, let alone pay for it. 
And I said, look, if we were really serious, we would all be driving diesel cars, we would have our tires inflated, we'd use compact fluorescent bulbs. And she said, Comp now this is a, a, a admittedly green reporter writing for the Earth Day section. And, I, and she said, compact fluorescents. She said, geez, do you have those in your home? And I said, and I have a strange question. I said, well, yeah. And I said, well, what, what do you do to be green? She said, well, I, I don't drive a car and I buy organic food. <laughs> and I said, well, look, you live in New York City, so not driving a car is not such a big compromise. And organic food's more about health. It actually is less productive. If you look at the quantum yields and everything, it, it's not so good. And uh, I said, you know, fertilizers and things actually, actually improve our energy efficiency. And she said, well, I can't believe, uh, you know, I said, look, compact fluorescence is a great story. She didn't realize I had spent a couple of years in GE actually running the lighting R&D group. And we had had a long time trying to figure out how do we get the consumers to buy compact fluorescence. And, and I, she said, geez, well, what does your wife think about that? Which is really a strange discussion from a woman <laughs> reporter. And I said, I look, she's fine. And actually, we had moved to Michigan, ironically, and uh, she said, you know, you need to go to Home Depot and get the CFLs because we have all these incandescent bulbs here. And she said, well, I think the light is so harsh. And I said, you know, I, I think you just proved my point. I don't know what I'm gonna, else to talk to you about, but compact fluorescents actually save you money. Anybody who understands lighting understands that 85% of the cost of light is the energy that you pay, and you use 23 watts in a compact fluorescent, not 100 watts, you pay for that. I'm not asking you to eat in the dark, I'll save you money, and you won't even do that because you think the light is harsh. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I think, you know, we, uh, you know, we provide a lot of the products that people look at. So insulation is one of our big products. We also um, have an issue there of, you know, people when they're specking their new houses, do you want granite countertops or better insulation? And it's very tough for the insulation to win in those kind of discussions. So, so I think we need to, in this dialogue, not forget the massive public awareness that's going to have to go with some of these choices if they're going to support them, especially if we're going to ask them to pay for them. And I would argue, don't be surprised, these things are going to cost more. We are at an optimum. We spent 100 years getting to these optimums, and they're not just going to revert. And then last, I wanted to talk about the model of the business challenge. So I talked about where is this capital going to flow in. And, and there's tremendous excitement that the world has gained by the venture community and small startups. But there's a unique challenge, and, and Dan sort of alluded to it, which is, so I'm on our venture board. I get to participate in a lot of venture and syndicate discussions. And the first word at every venture meeting is exit strategy. The venture model is built on turning your money very fast to invent in the next thing, or invent in the next thing. And the historical venture time frame, the funds used to be three, four years. You'd put your money at work for three or four years, then you'd take it out. Well, that's now moved to eight to 10 years. And when you're talking about energy, you're talking about building pilot plants that cost tens to hundreds of millions of dollars. And that's just a demonstration plant. That's not gonna have the cost that you need. If you really talk about big plants, they're billions of dollars of investment, and the venture community isn't gonna come up with that kind of money, and they don't wanna wait the five to 10 years. So there's a real issue of when you try to have a sustainable long-term strategy with a community that's used to a much shorter time frame that's actually trying to get back to a shorter time frame. And, and if you look at the historical venture community over the last 10 years, they've actually had no return. The numbers are actually negative. And uh, you know, a few, there's a, a few success stories that we hear about, but if you look at aggregate, the venture community, their returns have been stretched out longer and they've been negative returns. So we've got to understand how the interplay between government, industry, academia, national labs, and, and the venture small business community is going to work to make sure that the whole thing moves up. Now, I am more optimistic than I've ever been. I think we have more intelligent people asking the right questions in the government than we've ever had before. And I think there's been a unique partnership, whether it's the uh, electric cars or our drive towards renewable energy, where government and industry and academics really are pulling together. I think academic people are excited to work on real practical problems more than they've been in the past. I think the current slate of graduate students want to save the world. Everybody wants to come and work when we recruit. We have a big program on, on we're building plants for lithium ion batteries and we're building plants for what we call billion integrated photovoltaics or solar shingle. Every student thinks they want to come and work on that program. It's hard to get them to work on the more mundane things like insulation materials or the, the working fluid for the solar transfer, uh, the solar collector things. So I think it's a unique time, but it's also, uh, we have these challenges that we should not be naive about. Where is this capital going to go for, or, and where are the competitive offsets going to be? So I think, uh, you know, I've, I've never been more optimistic than I have in the past. And I think uh, it's an exciting time because we really can change the way we think about things. But we've got to not forget we have a big educational process to do as well. 
Thank you. So now we uh, open it up for questions for the panel. I'm Michael Bell, the American Business Society, and also CCNY. Mike, would you uh, grab the microphone? Michael Lubell with the American Physical Society and CCNY. Uh, Dan, uh, you raised a very uh, interesting question about consumer information. It's something we highlighted in our energy efficiency report. And Jason pointed out that there are rather few advocates, very effective ones, for energy. But there are people on the other side. Uh, one of our recommendations was that there should be at point of sale for any home an energy audit so consumers get information. And that has been blocked by the National Association of Realtors through very serious lobbying. They don't want to see that because they claim it will decrease their commissions. And on the other side, I mean, we've spoken to many members of Congress, congressional staff, and we're constantly told until the National Association of Realtors backs off, there will be no such requirement. And so I wonder what you do about something like this. I mean, do either of you guys have any thoughts? Uh, first of all, <clears throat> I'm not surprised by the resistance. Uh, uh, at the same time, I think there probably are some creative ways to, to put that information in, in front of people. First is just generally to inform them better about what it costs to operate a home. I think that's a basic lack of understanding that people have and the opportunity to to really make some significant changes. I will quickly tell you, one of my homes was built in the late 1700s. This was in, in New England, and um, we hired an energy auditor before we bought the home, and the guy was there and tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, come over here, I want to show you the, the, the pressure test. And, and I, I didn't really know how to read the screen, but he said, I said, what, what's the bottom line? He said, well, how many chimneys do you think this house has? And I said, well, it has four. He said, no actually has five. They had discovered a fifth chimney that had, was probably sucking, he said, about a third of the home's heat out for the last hundred years since it's been buried behind a wall. And I think there's just huge opportunities there. So number one, how do we make it inexpensive for people to do this, even if it's not required? One could imagine even building a potentially building an investment vehicle around this, you know, a shared savings sort of plan, you know, this is, these are not expensive sorts of things. You could imagine a, a, a credit, a tax credit at the state or federal level. You could imagine something that puts this sort of change on the value of the home and you get compensated as a result of that. There's a whole variety of ways that I think short of a mandate um, we could probably get at this. So, um, but it's, that's just the beginning. I think um, the, broader, the broader opportunity here is just to get people better, more real-time information about energy use in buildings. I just add, and I don't think it's uh, shocking insights, but there are obviously very significant corporate interests who logically would be on the other side of that equation. And you are seeing now um, through Homestar and a number of other programs, those organizations understanding who they are. And so it would seem to me that you know, one obviously would want to try to align those constituencies. Um, and then I think to, to Dan's point, I mean, the, you know, the realty industry is in a tricky spot right now. Um, it's, you know, it's blind desperation. And so um, that creates some opportunities if, in fact, there are ways in which one can increase um, tax credits early. And because we do have the sympathy in the administration to these kinds of goals, I think it might be possible to align some incentives for them that would make them feel less hostile. But if it's just straight up us against you, they're usually bigger than us. Um, Bill Fulkerson from the University of Tennessee. Uh, I would like to address, uh, to ask the panel, there is this, this, this crisis in funding that is upon us. Uh, uh, Norm Augustine's group said that we're a factor of three or more underfunding overall energy, R&D, let me put it R, D, and D. Uh, and uh, we're, that's all going to change for the worst. Uh, how do we get, let's say, 
the private sector to step up. Their funding in R&D relative to energy has actually been flat or negative for the last decade or more. Uh, how, how, are there innovations that one could think of, think of that would replace the federal dollars with private sector dollars in a more effective way? That's the question. Anybody ready to take that one on? Guy, really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I would like to make just a couple of questions, which is in a, nobody has unlimited constraints. So the first issue I'd argue is, so I have a $1.7 billion R&D budget. And if somebody told me that's going to double, I, I could not spend that money wisely. So the idea that we can spend billions of dollars increases wisely, I think, is probably a, a something we ought to question. I think we've got to try to argue for much more consistent and spread this out because you, I, I couldn't, if you gave me $300 million more, I don't know that I could hire enough people to spend that wisely. Second, I'd say you've just got to be more brutal in your prioritization. And I give, you know, Secretary Chu tremendous credit for saying stop this energy work on hydrogen. It's too far out there, there's too many miracles, and I can say, look for myself, I won't put one dollar into hydrogen because there's other things we can do that have more. So I think, now people don't like that, they, it's a lot easier to be uh, socialistic and do everything because then everybody loves you, but in my world, we, have, we never have enough money, we have to be brutal in our prioritization, and when there's a budget cut, you don't cut 10% from every program you cut 100% of the bottom 10% of your programs because your top programs are your top priority and you've got to continue to fund those. So I think we've got to be much more brutal about the choices that we make and that's tough in a political environment where there's a lot of views. And I think we've got to try to be conscious of the multiple horizons of technology we've got to invent and so that we don't get too skewed towards a whole bunch of research or a whole bunch of deployment and then you end up with uh, inconsistency in sort of the, the multi-generation steps that you take. Thank you. I'd just like to add to that because I come from a different sector, but as I mentioned, a couple of things. First of all, there, there, there has to be prioritization. When I wrote an article on the subject, somebody said this is – policy people don't worry about those things, but people tend to forget that in Bell Labs, which was a regulated monopoly at that time, we always chopped off the bottom. You always chopped up and make the choices. And in fact, he's absolutely right. You can't change the NREL budget by factors of 10 every alternate year and expect to do anything sensible. So there needs to be some kind of long-term trust where actually a like a tax, which is a stable, and there have to be very strong management accountability processes as well. And that sometimes is missing completely in many of the complex here. So that needs to be fixed first, and I'll keep writing about it. It's very important. No, I, that's not what I'm saying. But you must fix some of the other processes as well, otherwise you'll be wasting your money. Yes. Okay, we're going to take one more question because uh, uh, our next speaker is here soon. Emilio Mendez from Brookhaven National Laboratory. Uh, I would like to address a question to the whole panel uh, group. You have mentioned giving good examples of the value of regulation for instance, in terms of refrigerator, how the efficiency increased, and uh, now we are doing better than in the past. In your opinion, how far should the government go in terms of regulation? Should it go as far as, for instance, the European Union is doing, as banning uh, incandescent light? Should it go as far as uh, banning SUVs in terms of energy efficiency? Who's going to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, I, no. <laughs> I, I'm an industrial guy, so this is heresy to say, look, you will not affect the change you want without forcing consumers to do things. They, they should have been buying CFL 10 years ago. They should be buying LEDs now. They should have been driving diesels like Europe has been doing. You know, the, the, we, in, the internal combustion engines, diesel is just a better internal combustion engine. You don't need any invention to anything. You just buy a diesel, but there's a perception that you know, diesels are dirty, and they're not. With the clean emissions, and anybody who's come from Europe or driven, you know, look, those are amazing cars. And then you put on that hybrids and all the other things. I think to, 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 to drag the uh, average consumer to where they're making informed decisions on energy is a long road, and I think it's more expedient to just regulate things like saying all houses will have R30 in the walls. And, 
because I, I don't think they're going to opt. They're going to opt for the granite countertops, and they're and it's just a it's a challenge. So I think if the rules are fair, everybody can adapt to them. What's what's the challenge is there is so many different building codes in the United States. We don't have consistent building codes state to state, and so you really you can't drive a whole country or or you know a, a world if you're not going to have some kind of harmonization stuff and. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think some of these things, for the greater good, you're going to have to figure out how to do them. And, and but there's going to be tremendous political whiplash, realtors and consumers. And but I, I don't think there's a f the the CFL story was a very difficult thing for me to. How could you not <laughs> save somebody money and they still don't want to do it? All right, I think we'll draw things to a close. Let me th ask us to thank all of the panelists again. I was on their advisory board for a while. I know Dory and Leo and those guys. The previous two princess of Pat, I forget his name, Papal Baum. Oh, the previous CEO of Dow? No, no, the CTO, who was head of research. At Dow? Yes. Boy, so when I left, there was a guy. There was nobody there when I got there, so it must have been two or three generations ago. And there was the CTOs gone through generations. Was this one used? You know. No, I yeah, I just did that. No, I, I just didn't know if he if he used it or not. So it's a, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Stephen Coonan, the Undersecretary for Science of the Department of Energy. Dr. Coonan was confirmed as the second Undersecretary for Science in May 2009. He received his PhD in theoretical physics from MIT in 1975, joined the faculty at Caltech where he did pioneering work in computational physics and astrophysics uh, and many body theory. In 1995, he was named the seventh provost of Caltech. Between 2004 and early 2009, he served as the chief scientist of BP, where he was involved in their long-term strategy for renewable energy and alternative energy. <clears throat> Dr. Coonan uh, is a former chair of the Jasons. He received the Lawrence Award in 1998 from the Department of Energy and was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2010. Please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Coonan for his talk on sustainability, on sustainable solutions, fixing the unbalanced agenda. Dr. Coonan. Good. Thank you. I know I'm the last thing before lunch, so I'll try to at least keep you entertained to stave off the hunger pains. Uh, uh, I mean, I, you know, big picture, what I'd like to start with, uh, two theses. One is that global development and population growth will place unprecedented stre stress on resources in the next several decades. And this is what I call sustainability with a big S, the global issue. And then these same factors will have a profound influence on the U.S. and EU global and domestic circumstances. I like to call this the little s. Uh, including, of course, competitiveness. And I'd like to go through some of these trends um, 
And in fact, understanding how we can navigate these changes will be the major task for uh, the U.S. and the EU as we go forward. So three topics I'd like to cover. One is the global drivers, sort of the macro uh, economic and demographic trends that uh, I think in large extent are inescapable. I then want to talk about energy sustainability, uh, how we can manage the demand on energy and the stresses it places on the system, and then some thoughts about the little s problem as well, and hopefully leave plenty of time for discussion and Q&A. I see many familiar faces in the audience. I'm sure we can have a, a good discussion. Look, uh, let me start with this chart, which shows primary energy use per capita against GDP per capita. And um, while there are many interesting things to take away from this, I think the two are, first of all, the developed world, particularly the U.S. and the EU, show relatively large but slowly growing energy uses per capita, and that there is a broad swath of countries in the developing world whose per capita energy use is small but seems to increase monotonically and universally as they develop. And remember that most of the people are down here on the bottom, not up here on the top. Like all charts in terms of resource use and development, it goes up and to the right. Here is another example, not energy, but meat consumption. And um, you can see that as people get richer, this is a log log plot, but nevertheless, as people get richer, they like to consume more. And of course, meat places great stress on agricultural and water resources. You can make charts for many other things that look exactly like this. And so uh, that's one driver, the development of most of humanity. And the second is growth in numbers of people. We are right here in 2010, a little bit more than four times, uh, a little bit more than halfway through a quadrupling of the world's population in about a century. And you can see that most of that growth Will, uh, has and will occur in uh, Asia and uh, Africa, and that the populations in the developed world are relatively slowly growing. So those two factors together, the uh, consumption of resources increasing with economic well-being and the growth in populations, uh, here is shown flat topping at about 9 billion from the present 7 billion, drive a, a great uh, uh, stress in, in resource consumption. Another way to think about those uh, facts is the issue of balance. Right now, the U.S. is 4% of the world's people, 4.5%, and we account for about 20% of the consumption of stuff, whether it's 25% or 18%, depends on what things you look at, but electricity, automobiles, uh, web users, coal, gas, we're about 25% uh, 20 of the global economy and 4% of the people. That means relative to the rest of the world, we're out of whack by about 6 to 1. Okay. And that uh, impacts uh, both the draw on global resources expected going forward and the U.S. position. So the math is pretty simple and compelling. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're... Uh, 20% of current consumption for 3 billion people. If today's 7 billion people consumed at the U.S. per capita rate, you would see seven times the current resource use, unless society figures out how to use resources more effectively. And by 2050, when there are 9 billion people, we would consume six times current resource use. Unless we think that the EU is more virtuous by a lot, if you change, use the EU as a benchmark instead of the U.S., these numbers would go down by about 30 percent. But in any case, it seems that we're looking at multiples of the present resource draw as something that we're going to have to navigate. So let me use the example of energy as just uh, one of the resources that we will be drawing on and look at the projections. This is the EIA reference case showing energy demand globally. And you can see it, it going up significantly to 2030, and almost all of that growth occurring in the non-OECD countries. The non-OECD countries account for, in fact, 82 percent of the 44 percent increase that we will see in the next 20 years. And it seems to me, again, looking at the universality of that energy consumption versus GDP, 
down in the lower left-hand corner of that first graph I showed you, this seems in many ways almost inescapable. Right now, 80% of the world's energy comes from fossil fuels, and again, given the projections in the reference case, unless we do something dramatically different, and we'll discuss how possible it might be to do that, uh, we're going to see a more or less constant uh, dependence upon fossil fuels going forward. And as a result, greenhouse gas emissions will continue to grow. These are projections, again, split up in non-OECD and OECD. These are just numbers. I'm not trying to talk policy or technology here. This is just what one more or less will expect to happen. And as I like to point out, the greenhouse gas emissions are not the problem. They are how fast the problem is getting worse because, in fact, the CO2 accumulates in the atmosphere. So we have to reduce emissions drastically if we're going to have any impact. So what, what do I take away when I look at these trends and understand the technology? I think at least with respect to energy, we're not running out anytime soon. There, there is or there can be enough to meet demand, both in energy, food, agriculture. However, it is a complicated mix of economic policy and social factors that will determine whether we can, in fact, arrange for the resource to meet the demand. The technology can help here, but it is not sufficient. It is, in my mind, perhaps even more important than the technology will be these other societal factors. If I look at the technologies, the most important ones are biology, great uh, advance there in knowledge and slowly coming the, the advances in being able to engineer biology, materials, growing ability to synthesize, characterize model materials, and informatics, sensing, data analysis, modeling and simulation, and control. These all seem to be, to me, high leverage technologies that, in fact, the Department of Energy is pursuing. As we navigate these things, I think graceful supply curves can be a help. We're worried, some of us, not all of us, are worried about running out of uranium, for example, as the world starts to expand fission. But in fact, if you look, there is plenty of uranium resource. It's only a question of how much you want to pay for it. And in fact, since fuel is a relatively small part of the cost of fission electricity, as long as we can gracefully ride up the supply curve, there isn't going to be too much of a problem until the price gets too high, in which case we will do something else. As we climb up the supply curve, for example, for oil, we'll see conservation, new resources, and eventually substitution. The best policies are not always obvious. There are systems effects here and diverse interests. The land use discussion in biofuels is one example of perhaps policies that are not obvious. Informed and educated people and informed and educated decision makers are probably the best thing we can do. And just trying to get the facts out, both the trends, what the potential is of various solutions is important. And then finally, all of these sustainability problems take a long time to develop and a long time to fix. And my favorite example of that is the U.S. energy supply here that you see changing. I won't go into the details, but a, um, evolution from wood to coal to oil to uh, gas to a little bit of nuclear and then an even smaller fraction of renewables, driven not so much by changes in technology, although there is some of that, but more by policy, economics, and social factors. This takes decades to affect a shift in the uh, U.S. energy supply. It's interesting to ask why that happens. It happens because in energy supply, the capital assets are large. Large amounts of money are invested. They live for a long time. Energy is ubiquitous, so many people have different interests, and it doesn't change that rapidly. The interests of consumers, producers, NGOs, governments don't always align. And then finally, energy supply is a commodity. You can't tell the difference at the consumer level in how the electrons are produced in the grid or how the fuel molecules are produced. And so new technologies, in the end, have to compete on cost. I've been talking, and I apologize to Venky, who's heard the story before, but I don't apologize to Mark Kastner, who missed it at MIT last week. Uh, uh, 
you know, if, if you think about wanting to change the energy system, at least in the U.S., uh, and I think also to the EU to some extent, there is a simple syllogism that's worth going through. Many people don't realize. The U.S. energy system is almost entirely in the hands of the for-profit sector, right? except for some of the power administration entities. Uh, the, private, the industry owns and operates the, the, the uh, energy system. And um, the government does have regulatory influence to some extent, and we heard about the, there are 3,000-odd public utility commissions in this country that regulate energy, ele regulate electricity, and their motives are not always change. Their motives are to keep the rates as low as possible. Uh, the government also has limited influence in terms of spending. The Department of Energy spends $4 billion a year on energy research, another $5 billion on basic research, supporting energy, let's call it $10 billion in round numbers. The capital budget in the energy company I used to work in, BP, is $20 billion a year annually, twice the DOE spend. The entire U.S. energy spend is about $200 billion a year, so that is 20 times. Right? So the government has relatively feeble resources in which to try to catalyze change in this private sector dominated operation. I, I just said that. The second element of the syllogism is what is industry about? And you know, I, I say this, industry's goal is legal and predictable profit. All right? And I, I spent 28 years as an academic before I had an upfront view of a big private sector operation. I can tell you it was an eye opener. All right? The goal of making money really focuses the enterprise. Uh, it needs to do it legally. And it needs to do it predictably in the energy business because of the long time horizons. But in the end, it's about making money. It is not about deploying the coolest technology or being the greenest, although those may be tactics in service of profit. But in the end, it's about making money. And to do otherwise would be irresponsible to the shareholders. Therefore, you're not going to see innovation scaling in the energy system unless we can make it profitable or it's regulated in, uh, for business, all right? It's pretty simple. Another way to say it is that we only get the transformation in the energy system that government enables. Let me show you that real-world example. This is an example of regulation in the wind business. This shows wind capacity installed in the U.S. annually over uh, about an eight- or nine-year period. And there is this thing called the production tax credit that makes it economically favorable to put wind in. And the production tax credit has been going on and off uh, in the early part of this decade. And you can see the wind installation goes on and off uh, with business following its nose and making money or not. And that when it's stable, uh, the system responds. All right? So policy, stable policy that can rise to material impact is probably the most important thing we can do. What role does technology play? And here I'm talking about the big steel, not so much on the demand side, but on the supply side. When business thinks about a big project, there are many elements of risk that it is trying to manage. Certainly technology risk is one element, but there's construction risk, market risk, operations risk. And those latter elements, particularly market and operations, are much bigger levers to pull in making a project profitable than is a technology. And as a result, technologies take a long time to develop because you want to have confidence if you're going to bet several billion dollars in a big facility. You want to have confidence that it's going to work and give you the rewards that you expect. And it takes then a decade or more for a technology to go from the laboratory out to first commercial deployment, and then another decade or so to go into large-scale commercial deployment. So, you know, I came into the private sector thinking technology will invent the right thing. It'll just solve the whole problem. Wrong, because, in fact, by the nature of the energy business, people are very conservative. It's not because they're dumb. It's not because they're troglodytes. It is, in fact, because the nature of the investment horizon and the scale of the investment is such that you tend to be very conservative. All right.
So what does government need to do if it's going to try to catalyze a change in the energy system? And I think it is to play to the business mindset, learn how to think like a business. So as I said, well-considered and consistent policies are really important. The historical record on that in this country at least is not great. I can't talk about the EU. Mitigate the risks. Think about risks for early movers, right? Technology risk, the national labs can help with their research capabilities. Computer simulation, I think, has a lot that it can offer, and we're trying to push that in the Department of Energy. And then test beds, whereby you don't need to have a large-scale facility like a small grid or a national syngas facility where you can try to test out some of the technologies without taking the big capital risk. Market risks we can alleviate by renewable power standards, renewable fuel standards, power purchasing agreements, all business elements that can try to take some of the risk out of deploying new technology, and then the loan guarantees that we're using in the department to try to facilitate the commercial deployment of new technologies. These are all levers that we have, I think, to try to get inside the business mindset and facilitate deployment. We're also looking at new research structures to catalyze this transformation, taking it from the laboratory out to commercial deployment. Energy Frontier Research Centers focused on basic research, the energy innovation hubs, which span basic research through technology demo with significant industry involvement. RPE, which is funding smaller, shorter-term, higher-risk uh, ventures, and then finally uh, scale-up mechanisms like the loan guarantees, tax credits, and other financial subsidies. All really important if we're going to try to make things change in the energy system faster than has been the case historically. All right, finally, a couple words about U.S. competitiveness and how all of this plays. Um, this chart is a, a perhaps different depiction of some of the trends I was trying to tell you about at the beginning. I show the fraction of GDP in different countries or sectors against the fraction of population. And you can see it is really mismatched. And I don't know much beyond physics, but I do know something about the second law of thermodynamics, and it says that things tend to relax toward equilibrium, and this circumstance is going to change. And in fact, you can see it changing already. If you go compared to the U.S. and the rest of the world, these are relative populations of U.S., EU, China, and India. The rest of the world is more numerous. The rest of the world is hungrier, lower GDPs per capita. The rest of the world is by and large younger, except this is population growth. The U.S., you would say, well, look at that, but a lot of that is immigration. Uh, and then finally, the rest of the world is developing faster. These are GDP growth rates uh, scaled to uh, 10%. And, and so the circumstances are what they are. And in fact, the rest of the world is just as smart. And when you look at these trends, you realize that we need to do something very different in the U.S. and EU. This, uh, again, shows one example of trends in uh, uh, one of the economic areas Worldwide shipments of photovoltaics, uh, you can see basically that contrary to what the public might think, the U.S. is nowhere in this, and we have seen production grow up uh, in Asia and Europe, stimulated by policies, much more so than what's been going on in the U.S. And when you look at it, this is a similar situation in many other areas, at least for the U.S. Fuel-efficient automobiles are manufactured elsewhere, battery technology, is almost entirely uh, out of the U.S. at this point. I was at GM yesterday talking about where they get their batteries from, and the dominance of the rest of the world, particularly China, in automobile battery supply is stunning. Of course, the government is trying to do something about that with the stimulus monies that we have dispersed to get battery production going in Michigan and other states, but uh, we've got a long way to go. Electricity transmission, China is putting in transmission systems that are two generations ahead of what we're talking about in the U.S. Power electronics uh, virtually disappeared from the U.S. research scene. Uh, in my former life back in the late 90s, I helped retire the last faculty member at Caltech in power electronics. Boy, what a mistake that was. All right. uh, nuclear power, similarly, we don't build nuclear plants in this country, at least commercial nuclear plants, uh, at full scale anymore. 
So lots of technologies like that the U.S. is developing, but then seeing their implementation and production go offshore. You start to think about what are the advantages that the U.S. has as we look forward to what will the U.S. look like 20 years from now. America is to some extent the only country founded on an idea, the idea of the individual, an opportunity, not on the basis of ethnic or religious uh, affiliation. We have the rule of law, a vibrant innovation system, a free flow of capital when the capital is there to flow, uh, protection of intellectual property, higher education, one of the crown jewels of this country. Many of these same things, of course, apply to the EU as well. On the other hand, the infrastructure in the U.S. has already been built over the last hundred years while the developing world is building. Uh, that means the developing world is newer and more efficient, as you know if you've been to airports in Asia recently. The U.S. infrastructure, however, needs desperately to be rebuilt, but it is not a particularly sexy thing politically to talk about. The skills and capabilities that one needs to do this rebuilding are much better represented abroad. All of the young talent in India and uh, China goes into the engineering that you need, civil engineering, power electronics, et cetera, to do that building. It's not on the radar screen here very much at all. This has profound implications, I think, for how we think about immigration policy, labor, and what we do for education. And then finally, the U.S. is not a favored manufacturing venue for most of what we do. How do we fix that? It, in my view, extends beyond green jobs. That's one tool, perhaps. But whether the jobs are green, brown, or purple, uh, they're not happening here for manufacturing. We've got to figure out how to fix that. Recap, and then uh, I'm finished. Global development and population growth are placing unprecedented stresses on resources, and those same factors are profoundly influencing U.S. and global circumstances. These are complex issues without easy or obvious solutions. I think government can play a productive role in supporting innovation and trying to set the playing field for the transformation that should follow that innovation. We've got to, I think, begin a frank conversation in the political, academic, and business spheres about these trends, and I was pleased to see the update of the gathering storm that just came out that talks about a lot of these things in much more frank language than we have heard before. To be aware we're headed and understanding the implications of the policy decisions that we're making. Navigating these changes, as I said at the beginning, will be the major task for the next several decades. I think, by the way, just one word in closing, the universities have a particularly important role to play here. They can take a longer time horizon. They can synthesize the kind of multidisciplinary thinking that you need in order to sort this out. They've done that in the past and other problems. If you look at the nuclear strategy field that sprung up in the beginning of the 50s, many universities were able to put together the technical folks, the political people, the military people to try to create a body of knowledge and understanding that has helped us navigate that sphere. I think we need to do the same thing now for competitiveness and some of these other issues I've talked about to try to get some analysis and understanding out into the public discussion. And with that, thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take some questions or comments. Lunchtime. Mike. <laughs> I see that was a, uh, an enlightening and, and uh, somewhat depressing uh, portrayal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, let me just uh, ask you a, uh, a rather simple question. You spoke, you showed a chart showing basic research. You had, you know, the time frames of various sorts of things, uh, deployment and so forth. One thing I did not see on there was the time frame laid out, or the, let's say the uh, uh, the motivation for long-term applied research, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which seems to be lacking wherever we look in industry and in government, and the question is, what do we do about it? Boy. Um, I think you're right. Um, uh, even within the Department of Energy, uh, we don't do as an effective job as we could uh, to get the basic and applied coupled up. There's that gap in the middle. 
as, as I think we've discussed, many universities have a Department of Applied Science, and there's a good reason for that that is distinct from the basic sciences and, and the engineering. Um, you know, former professor and me again, try to get people to understand why we need to do that. I think the department leadership in the DOE has got that understanding, and now we need to propagate that out to OMB uh, in the Hill. Hi, I'm Bob Eichert from the U.S. Agency for International Development, and obviously what you said rings very true for us in looking at what's happening to energy demand around the world and what are the strategies to help countries meet those demands and at the same time uh, move toward a cleaner environment in the future. So, I mean, clearly that's one of the big challenges that we all face, and, and obviously I mean, we're talking about a global energy market and what the U.S. role will be in that market. And I think, you know, over my 30 years, I mean, I've seen fewer and fewer, uh, less and less interest from U.S. companies in those overseas markets. And I think that um, the issue is, I mean, obviously we see that there's a potential for commercialization of these technologies that can have, I think, positive spin-offs with regards to the U.S. company's profitability and, and in terms of the uh, ability and interest in R&D investments. Why isn't that, why is that happening? And why aren't U.S. companies more active and want to compete in a broader range of international markets than other, I mean, obviously China and some of the other ones are a major focus of, because of the size and, and, and the growth, but it, the growth is occurring everywhere. So I, I would challenge a little bit um, that U.S. companies don't want to compete. I was just at GM yesterday, as I mentioned, a good fraction of their production and sales happens abroad. Um, and the energy companies I know, including the one I was with, but others as well, uh, would be very eager to participate more in the markets in the developing world. Um, in the end, business looks to where the profits are and also where it can get market access. Uh, access, into, to take China as a particular example, uh, has not been easy for the big companies at all. So it's, I don't think it's a lack of will. I think it's a lack of just being able to make it happen. And the U.S. government role, how do you see that in terms of the DOE and the export-oriented? Yeah, so I, look, I think uh, trying to level the trade playing field is extraordinarily important. I heard Senator Stabenow yesterday talking about her take on that. She's very interested in those issues. She talked about what surprised me as a number of circumstances where we don't have a level playing field, and I think if the government got a bit stronger about trying to make sure that we, we do have parity as we trade with countries, that would be very useful and interesting. So thank you for very interesting uh, diagnostic, I would say, you did. And in particular, you have presented the, for energy technologies uh, this question comparison with other parts of the world, in particular European Union. And just two weeks ago, I made an analysis of this eco-innovation or eco-industries uh, aspects. And uh, I have the, the following remarks, is that it's also a, an answer to a question which was put. You know, for eco-industries, uh, the number of regulations which exist in Europe is around 20 regulations. You have the waste directive. You have also some targets for this 20% renewable, 20% energy efficiency, 20% reduction of. And uh, I have to say, the results of this, the results of this, as have been presented by uh, Jean-Michel Bez this morning, is that the increase of exportation, which is an indicator of exportation of these technologies between the last 10 years was around 44%. What I have seen, comparing with the U.S. exportation for the same technology, it was 4 or 5%. Mm -hmm. So that means we can say, I don't want to give a judgment value, but my feeling is that when you say you have to be competitive or there is a mandate to, to develop, I think the mandate are very, very important aspects. Look, I, I, I would agree, and, you know, uh, policy basically, right? Uh, at the consumer level, which we were talking about in the panel at the end, um, I think there are three levers you have. There's price, 
which at least in the U.S. is a very difficult thing to talk about, particularly for fuel and electricity. Uh, you have standards, and we're trying to push the automobile standards up uh, dramatically, as, as you will know. And then finally, there's behavior. If we can give people information about their energy consumption, I, I heard a stunning statistic somebody told me. If we could get everyone in Texas to drive at the speed limit, we would save 12% fuel use in Texas. It's probably more difficult than raising the gas tax, but nevertheless, um, right? Tire inflation, there's simple behavior. So we've got to work all those levers. Thanks. David Blockstein with the National Council for Science and the Environment, uh, Council of Energy Research and Education Leaders. I'm interested if you could elaborate a little bit on your comment about the uh, role and opportunities for higher education and what kinds of uh, things you're, you're looking for from higher education and what kinds of innovations that you see that should be made and, and the role of government perhaps in facilitating those. Yeah. So um, I, I think you would distinguish maybe three things that higher education does. One is to train the researchers and um, I think a growing training of graduate students and postdocs in energy relevant material would be important, but they should also understand the context in which they're they're working so you know an energy minor or an energy certificate uh, the way some of the universities are starting I think would be really important also we lack and, and it's sort of in the same direction people who are technical and understand the policy aspects deeply at the same time all right I, you know I'm an amateur in policy what do I know but I, I think having people who cross that cross over would be very important. Also, uh, in higher ed, as, as I mentioned before, I was fortunate enough to spend five years in the private sector, and what an eye-opener. If we can somehow get some of the faculty to get exposed in that same way, uh, I think we'd go a long way to on the research end to making things happen. I, on the general education end, uh, undergraduate literacy in, in energy, really important. Um, Energy 101, right? Where does it come from? How do we use it, et cetera? What are the impacts, et cetera, et cetera? Really important. I mean, I go around. I, I, this is only one slide from a more general energy talk I've been doing over the last five or six years. And the, the, thing, the basic things that people just don't know are astounding. And how are we going to fix it if people don't understand, right? Uh, and then finally, I think uh, uh, that kind of synthetic work by the faculty that brings together the technology, the science, climate science, uh, environmental science, uh, and the social dimensions, really important. So I'd like to see more of that. How can the government help? Um, listen to academia and, of course, provide more money. Uh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, very good. Thank you.